I'm really excited for this topic tonight. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Thanks for being here, folks. All right. So, yeah. So whenever you're ready to share the presentation, Carlin, go ahead. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, um, for everybody who got to join us before we got started, it was great to see you and um, great to see your names. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Juanita Palliner. I'm with the Spina Bifid Association. And so I wanted to welcome you and thank you for joining the Spina Bifida Association's SBU session a discussion about grieving through the lens of spina bifida. And just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we are recording the session uh, so that we can share it with other people um, after today's live session. And then also you can rewatch it whenever, whenever you want. Um, it will be available on SBA's website and then also um, on the SBU playlist in our YouTube channel. And as we already discussed, um, please use the question function. If you have any questions or comments, uh, we'll try to address as many as we can today between um, the panelists. Um, we can all just try to answer the questions as many, as many of your questions as we can today. And now I'm excited to introduce our moderator and our panelists. Um, we are so grateful to have all of them. And um, we wanted to I want to introduce Carlin Brugel, uh, who is a clinical psychologist, um, and she is going to be moderating today's session. And she's also a member of the Adult um, Advisory Council of the Spina Bifida Association. And all hello. <laughs> and also uh, you can see their pictures and their live screen. Um, we have Brian Gutierrez, who is also with the SBA Adult Advisory Council, and Clarissa, Noel, and Libby Powers. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Brian, Clarissa, and Libby. And with that, um, Carla and I turn it over to you. Wonderful. So welcome, everyone. So uh, our topic uh, this evening is grief. Uh, so first, uh, let's list off some common sources of grief. Uh, someone might uh, be in a state of grief due to the loss or decrease uh, in their functioning due to a disability. Uh, this could be a, a congenital disability like ours, or it could be an acquired disability. Uh, it could also be uh, that they have continued to lose functioning over time and are starting to grieve that continual loss. Uh, we can also grieve missed opportunities due to our disability, places we can't travel, things we can't do, uh, sports that we'll never be able to play or not be able to play on the level of an able-bodied person. These are normal things to grieve in life. Uh, we can grieve the loss of an imagined uh, alternate self of who could I have been if I hadn't been disabled or who could I have been if I had gone to a better college or who could I have been if I hadn't had this terrible injury uh, that negatively impacted my functioning. We can also grieve due to social rejection or the inability to connect with other people or the loss of relationships. Uh, we can grieve experiences or encounters with discrimination. Uh, I, we can also grieve uh, systemic injustices and obstacles that we encounter in the world due to our disability, but also due to other things. Uh, I alluded to this, but the anticipated loss of your own or someone else's life or your own or someone else's current level of functioning. Uh, of course, you can also grieve the death or other loss of a friend, a loved one, uh, someone you cherish, uh, even a celebrity or a role model, certainly a pet, and even a healthcare provider of, oh no, this person is retiring or they're gone, uh, who is going to replace them? And of course, other adverse or traumatic life events that we haven't listed here. So folks, uh, tell me more about uh, the uh, 
sources of grief uh, that you think impact or, or affect people with spina bifida? And what should the people around you keep in mind uh, when interacting or working with the grieving person with spina bifida? Who would like to go first? Carlin, I think this is Libby. I think that it is first and foremost important to acknowledge and understand that us as a community, I mean, those uh, adults and family members who have somebody they love and cherish, cherish with spina bifida have also and can also experience grief and loss. And I think that is first and foremost important to acknowledge that in our community, we've experienced loss of those that we know and our own peers and um, who have spina bifida and understand that that is a part of, um, while it's a part of life, it is still, hard and not um an easy thing to go through in life and I think that as a person with a disability there's a lot of fear and misunderstanding of when somebody even if they're old or young die unexpectedly and I think that's important to acknowledge that we have lost um, many people that we care about and love and hold community with um, as a part of the Spina Bifida community. Yeah, and I mean, we've even lost people in the past year. And I think that's a, a really central uh common source of grief for SB people. And I think we grieve the losses of our friends and community members. And I think this also then makes us think about ourselves and our own health and our own mortality. So uh, I think we can end up having a double grief uh, when we lose someone in the community. So who else has a thought? Yeah, I'd like to go definitely, um, for sure, absolutely. Um, I think when it comes to our community, for sure, absolutely. We face many different challenges along the way. And uh, we, we can't lose someone with spine bifida unexpectedly. And I lost my friend Robert. Um, his passing certainly had an effect on me. And we bonded, uh, we bonded well together. And, you know, when we think about losing someone with spine bifida, we just think about losing a, a brother or sister because they are part of our, our community and they understand who we are and what we go through on a daily basis. So it's really, really important that, like Libby said, that we acknowledge that, to acknowledge that people with spine bifida um, face many different challenges. And yes, we can definitely um, have an expiration date sooner rather than later, but it's also to, to acknowledge that there are also cultural differences too. Um, that I think that, you know, our community makes it very diverse is that we are very, you know, culturally diverse too. And I think that that's also part of that that needs to be taken into consideration is, is definitely um, among healthcare professionals is that we are also culturally diverse and we respond and cope to grief um, differently. Yeah. Clarissa, do you have a thought? Um, yeah, I think like Brian was saying and how you were saying about losing uh, people in our community. And I think that, um, Carolyn, you kind of touched on the fact that that makes us think of our own mortality. And I think that it not only gives us a sense of grief that we have to deal with, but also a sense of anxiety um, that you don't normally see in other able-bodied people um, because our stories are very similar. Um, and so it's like you, you, sometimes put yourself in the same perspective as other people. And it gives you a real sense of like, okay, like sh what should I be doing differently? Um, am I doing the right thing? Um, and it just adds on a different layer of self-care that we need to be aware of yep. that I think other people have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, 
I know for me, it's like, I've lost people throughout my lifetime with spina bifida and, you know, you think about them and, and what you do on a daily basis. And so um, it definitely gives you a heightened sense of self um, yeah. and how you take care of yourself. Um, and you grieve, right? Because when you reach milestones in life, um, you think of those people who aren't here and aren't able to reach those milestones. And there is a sense of guilt also. Um, yeah. Right. Because it's like they should be here and they should be able to do this. And so but I think that also can be a positive thing. Um, I think we can turn it around and say, hey, you know, they are no longer here. Let me kind of, you know, carry the torch, so to speak, and live my life in a positive way and a productive way for those that can't. Yeah. And, and something else that I think people around a grieving SB person should keep in mind is, I think for me, uh, I'm very close to my parents because I think we've had a very close, unique relationship and they've also been my caretakers uh, emotionally and physically and have coordinated a lot of things uh, in my life that uh, able-bodied uh, families don't have to navigate. Uh, so I'm uh, anticipating losing my parents someday. And I think that's going to be emotionally and, and uh, logistically difficult for me on multiple levels that it wouldn't be for maybe just your standard able-bodied person who is just sad that their parent is gone. So thank you for those answers. So uh, grief uh, can look and feel like sadness, depression, apathy or disinterest in work, uh, personal self-care, hobbies, previously enjoyed activities. It can look and feel like total numbness, feeling nothing at all. It can feel like, uh, Clarissa touched on this feeling, guilt, remorse, or shame, uh, like survivor's guilt, or a sense of, I don't really have it that bad, why do I feel so bad? It can look like anger, denial, self-distraction, keeping busy. Uh, if I just keep on moving and bury myself in my tasks and work, I won't have to think about the loss. And it can also uh, look like an anxiety or an anticipatory fear of the other shoe dropping, so to speak, something else going wrong or some other loss occurring. So in what ways might uh, an SB person's grief differ from the grief of an able-bodied person? And in what ways uh, might it be uh, similar or the same? And again, other things that people should keep in mind in terms of how we might manifest or experience grief. I have. Um, so I think you touched on the fact that we grieve our parents differently when we lose them, if we've already lost them, because, you know, they are our caretakers um, sometimes in our lives. Um, and so I think that, you know, it does look different because they're not only our parents who love us and care for us on just a basic level, but also that caretaker role. Um, and so I think that's important to recognize and to acknowledge. Um, and also, um, I think now as I've gotten older, for me, I've tried, because I no longer live with my parents, I've tried to kind of uh, separate those two roles as parent and caregiver um, and be a little bit more independent in that way, uh, as much as I can be, um, so that they feel that I'm okay and that I feel that I'm okay if one day they are no longer here. Mm -hmm. um, and to enjoy them as parents you know, to enjoy that relationship. Um, and I think that also speaks to, so I have been married for four years and there is a sense of caretaker with my husband and that's been hard to navigate as well. Yeah. Um, because he is just my husband, right? He doesn't have to be my caregiver. He doesn't, and there's that fine line. Um, and so there's there's that that role, that double dual role that people play in our lives. Yeah. Libby or Brian, do you have a thought on these questions? Yeah, I can definitely go next. Um, kind of want to piggyback what Clarissa just mentioned. Um, I think that growing up with the, with the disability like spinal bifida, 
you know, oftentimes we 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 find ourselves in in a supporting, loving family, and that's our parents, right, who are willing to take care of us until we become an adult. However, some of us are still living with our parents because, you know, of cultural, you know, perspectives or differences or the way that they were raised by how to take care of their children once they become adults. However, that journey still continues. Um, for example, my mom still takes care of me, even though I'm more dependent than how I was like about 10 or 15 years ago when I was in high school or even in middle school. Um, I have a college degree, I have a master's degree. Thankfully, with her support, I was able to achieve those milestones. But she wants me to become a much better independent person once she leaves or once with my mom or actually if my dad uh, passes away. She wants me to uh, be in better hands. And of course, there are also those parents out there too from a cultural perspective that are overly protective. And that is understandably reasonably um, you know, fine. Right, my for example, my mom is overly protective of me. She wants me to be in an environment where I feel safe, where I feel protective, and where I feel validated. Um, if I don't have those things in place, then she may feel like a loss of depression, mm. uh, or depression, or a loss of you know sense of identity, or even grief, because she wants me to have all these things once um, once she leaves, or once my father leaves too. So. Yeah. I think it's also to consider just that cultural perspectives and differences that uh, our community um, definitely um, has. Yeah. So, so yeah. And Libby, do you have a thought on how people with spina bifida might manifest or experience grief and what other people should know? Well, I think what's important too is to acknowledge that regardless of disability, regardless of our circumstances, stances in life, we can experience grief at any point in time in our lives, even as children and as um, teenagers and as adults, of course. I think that in one way that is different, our grief is different, is that we have a, there's a societal I don't know what to call it, but perspective and thought that individuals with disabilities, regardless of whether it's spina bifida or not, are born resilient and are born to survive anything. And I think that is often something that is forgotten when you're grieving, mm -hmm. um, is that you don't have to be resilient and you don't have to be strong and you don't have to be somebody who can take care of everyone else because taking care of yourself when you're grieving is just as important as um helping others to uh make sure that they are feeling supported and cared for i think that is something that is big in the disability community overall is that we have these ideas of what a person with a disability feels or mm -hmm. how they should feel right in a certain situation and sometimes those perceptions get mixed up and yep. um we are treated differently or thought of as differently but it's important to realize that in especially grief we experience the same type of emotions and uh, feelings and loss um, as a person without a disability. We, we still have the same fundamental emotions. And yes. I think the only difference that maybe tentatively occurred to me is I remember coming across some study years ago of depression in people with spina bifida, and they found that we didn't necessarily tick uh, every critical item in the BDI uh, that we might be experienced, which is a, uh, the Beck depression scale, and that we might still be experiencing depression, but we may not show outward signs like crying. Uh, mm -hmm. 
So I think we may, uh, some of us may demonstrate a kind of stoicism, uh, depending on, I think, who we are as people. Uh, mm -hmm. But just because the person looks stoic on the outside doesn't mean that they're not hurting on the inside. And Libby, I think you brought up a great point about resilience, that uh, I think we also have a very stereotyped uh, as a culture view of resilience that uh, resilience is the 90s action hero who stares off uh, in into the uh, the rubble uh, without shedding a tear and just keeps on marching uh, and uh, I don't think that's necessarily the uh, perfect picture of resilience. I think sometimes resilience is just uh, you suffer a loss or a trauma and you keep on surviving and moving forward and you mm -hmm. still hurt uh, and you're still in pain and you're still struggling, but mm -hmm. you uh, hang on hour by hour, day by day. And I think mm -hmm. that sometimes is all resilience is, is hanging on. Well, and I think too, sometimes resilience also means that it grows and changes as you grow and change as a yes. person. And I think that um, I definitely learned that I lost uh, my father when I was uh, 19 years old. And so I've lived my entire adult life without uh, one of my parents. So I learned very early on how to survive and thrive and, but still keep the memories and the uh, great times that I had with my father alive because just because you grow and change and grief grows and change as you age doesn't mean that thing, it isn't just as sad or isn't just as lonely um mm. of an experience um regardless of how much time moves on mm -hmm. and 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 that, that is resilience as thriving mm -hmm. uh of that we take what we experience and we uh heal as best we can from it we uh utilize it to become uh stronger better wiser uh, uh, and transform into a person that we feel good about. I mean, that's the, I think that's capital R resilience is, uh, turning lemons into lemonade and invert adversity into strength and wisdom. Mm -hmm. So thank you for those. So, uh, there's no one right way to grieve. Your feelings are valid and normal, whatever they may be. During a grieving period, uh, your emotions may be erratic, intense, and unpredictable. It's normal to feel fine uh, or normal at some moments and then be overtaken by a very sudden wave of emotion. And remember that change is the fundamental law of the universe. Tomorrow's not going to be the same as today, and an hour from now won't even be the same as right now. So uh, I think I like to instill hope by reminding people that you may feel terrible in this moment, but hang on, uh, things are uh, uh, th inevitable uh, uh, to change. Uh, change is inevitable. Uh, so you just keep putting one foot in front of the other uh, and take things hour by hour, day by day. So what other advice or words of comfort do you have for those currently going through a grief process? Um, I think for me, um, you were saying that, you know, things may be different tomorrow. And, and that's true, you know, things may not always look the same. And that um, can be comforting, because you know that things aren't always going to be the same. Um, and I think it's okay to acknowledge when things stay the same, to, yep. under, to understand and to honor that, to understand that, you know, we may be grieving for a while, you yep. know, and that is okay. That just means that whatever you're grieving was important to you and that you acknowledge that and that you reach out to people or have the resources available to you so that when that happens, you can better acknowledge it. And to say, you know, this is my grief right now. I, I like to name it. Uh, in therapy, I learn to name things. And so then I can kind of put it away for a little bit and 
And, and when I need to revisit grief, that's okay too, because then I can remember those that are no longer here, or I can better assess what I want to do in life. You know, if life isn't looking the way that I want it to, then, okay, how, why, what do I want my life to look like? And how can I get there? Or how can I make it better? You know, maybe we don't get the life that we wanted, but maybe we can have a great, better, a better life than we thought we could, you know? So just because things are not linear in life doesn't mean that you can't get there. Yep. Um, you know, uh, I never thought I'd be married and I've been married for four years. I never thought I'd have a bachelor's degree and I hold one now, you know, and I never thought I'd have a steady job and I do, you know, and, and it's those things, it's those milestones that we hold so dear because that's what society says that we should. Um, and that might not look like the same for everyone. And that's okay. Like maybe it's being able to get up in the morning and do for yourself. Maybe it's, you know, having other milestones to look forward to. And so I learned that, like, I always thought, okay, when is this going to be over? When am I not going to be sad anymore? And that's not true. Like you could be sad today and happy tomorrow. And then next week, something else will happen because life happens. But, you know, we continue to, you know, just acknowledge those times and move forward and and that, I think that's what we talk about, right? Like just having tools in our repertoire to like handle those things, you know, when they come. Absolutely. Uh, Brian or Libby, do you have other, uh, do you have your own words of advice or comfort for those going through grief? Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely go next. Um, I think that grief is like an ongoing process, no matter what stage of grief we are in. Um, also seeking professional support when you are ready, um, you know, if you feel that it's helpful for you and can no longer, you know, manage your, uh, your emotions in a healthy way. Um, it is indeed okay to not feel okay. And it is also okay to seek help, especially when you feel lost or you have experienced fatigue or have a loss of identity or purpose. Um, I would also say that giving yourself enough space when you can reflect and appreciate those you still have that you can lean on uh, for support during a difficult time of grief, uh, following like a, you know, a death of a loved one or a significant uh, or emotionally impactful events that can lead to grief. So it's, it's really not the end of the world. We can always just rely on for support uh, for people who are willing to, to listen to us and who are willing to support us um, effectively and appropriately. Libby, do you have a word of advice or comfort? I think what is most important is that there is no time limit. Um, life will move on. Um, and great things will happen. Not so great things will happen. And grieving at different times in your life is okay. And grieving the same loss that you had years ago is okay. Mm -hmm. I think that we tend to like to put time limits and um, an end to different things and grief's no exception. And I think that that is a misconception that society has is that we need to put a time limit to everything. And grief is something that you never get over mm -hmm. in reality it is something that you will always have but it will become a part of your life and will become easier and harder at certain times and that's kind of the nature of grief and that's okay it's not something that you should feel ashamed about it's not something that you should feel bad about. It just is what life is. And that's the nature of what grief is, is that it's on a continuum. Mm. And, but there are certain degrees of that continuum. Yep. Um, and just because you feel, feel it one way this time doesn't mean that you'll always feel it right. the same way. I think that's true. And I, I think I think you flagged that 
uh, uh, it may never completely heal over and we may still feel it, but I mean, some things are never fixed. They are merely managed or carried. Mm -hmm. Thanks folks. So let's talk about how to take care of you if you're currently experiencing grief. Uh, when times are tough, it's even more important to keep our bodies fueled by doing our best to get rest, food, and hydration to the best of our ability. Stay connected with supportive people, even when you're taking time for yourself. Solitude is important too, but be sure to stay connected with supportive people. Let people around you know how they can best help and support you. Be mindful of your triggers and do your best to anticipate and navigate them. And uh, therapy can work wonders. Seek support from a trained mental health professional to manage your grief. What are other ways a person can or should take care of themselves physically, psychologically, and otherwise when grieving? Who wants to answer, Clarissa? I can answer that. Um, for me, um, just a little story of myself. I dealt with a lot of um, big emotions this year and really tough times this year. This was a hard year for me, uh, medically speaking. Um, and so that kind of bled into just daily life, uh, dealing with medical issues um, on my day-to-day -day basis. It just became a lot. Um, so I did reach out to somebody, a professional, and we did therapy sessions and and that was wonderful. Um, and then she, you know, acknowledged my feelings and kind of was unbiased and just kind of listened. Um, whereas I think a family member or a loved one can sometimes just want to, you know, coddle us and just be, you know, they want to fix it. And, and, you know, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes we need someone to just fix it, but sometimes we just need someone to listen and a professional can do that for you and it worked wonders on me and I that is something that I will continue to go back to um, as as a tool and then also for me I found that a, a routine a daily routine really helped uh, something super basic getting yep. up in the morning uh, getting dressed uh, taking a shower you know eating breakfast um, even if it was just watching a a show that I found comfort in, you know, if I did that every day, then that was great because then it, whatever came my way, if there was something that made me sad or angry or anxious, then I could rely on those habits to fall back on and feel normal on my day. Um, and so I think having a routine down, whatever that looks like for you, um, even if it's a couple of little tasks every day, um, is great. Love it. Yeah, I agree about the routine that uh, routines can be great in general, but uh, absolute lifesavers uh, figuratively and literally when we're going through a difficult time, because then we have a reason to get up in the morning and we're also uh, bringing those changes into our lives that I talked about. If we're, we're changing our conditions and that shows promise of changing our uh, mindset and feelings. Libby or Brian, uh, other thoughts on how people can take care of themselves? I think yeah, what's absolutely. really, oh, sorry, Brian. It's okay, go ahead. <laughs> I think that what's really also important for individuals um, and how they should take care of themselves is that grief can, while grief can be a very lonely experience and a very isolating experience for some people, I think it's really important to remind everyone that it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. It's okay to at, reach out for support and it's actually encouraged. And whether that's reaching out to loved ones, friends, or someone else, that is really important because you don't, in sad times or difficult times like going through grief, you don't want to pull yourself so far inwards that you can't get yourself out. Um, it's important to have an outlet and to find that person or activity to help 
express yourself and to release those emotions because building, letting them build up and continue to build will just mean that it's much harder um, to help uncover yourself from those feelings alone. So it's important that you reach out to somebody and to talk to them, someone um, and get out and do something that is nourishing to your body and to your mind and to uh, your spiritual selves too, because it's important to acknowledge that grief affects every aspect of your life, no matter what it is. Mm, yes. Ryan, uh, uh, one thought on how someone can take care of themselves when grieving. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, piggyback what Clarissa and Libby just mentioned, you know, definitely just finding out what's, what best works for you and what's productive and healthy for you while you're going through a difficult time. Um, some ways for me that I found very, like, very therapeutic was really like confining and leaning on trusted family members and friends uh, for support uh, when grieving. Also, uh, journaling your emotions might be another way to go cope with grief, especially if you like writing. Uh, you do not have to share your journal with anyone as it can definitely provide you um, freedom to express yourself. And as mentioned, um, seeking professional help, like speaking to a mental health therapist, might be best when you are unable to process your emotions and you're feeling stuck or feeling on, on like burden. And if you do not have any friends or family members that you can definitely rely on uh, for trust and support when you're going through grief, um, you know, so definitely it's figuring out what's what's best for you. Uh, in other words, what is, what is home to your soul for you? Yes. What works for you best? And so like, yes, finding out what is like healthy therapeutic and productive for you is very crucial for going through the grief process. Yes. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, so here are some ways to process grief, uh, art and self-expression, journaling, writing, scrapbooking, uh, music, uh, something creative, seeking community, meaning and coherence through the spiritual practice of your choice creating a personalized ritual to memorialize grief and release the thing or the person you've lost, confiding in and leaning on those around you, joining a support group, spending time in nature or in another safe, comforting place. Just fundamentally do whatever feels safe, productive, and healthy for you. Are there methods of processing grief that you found helpful or unhelpful? I find talking to people, uh, I'm a verbal processor, so that's what I do. What do y'all do? Um, I can go. Uh, for me, two things have been really helpful. Uh, for me, I, I do exercise. Um, I, I, I work at a gym. I work at, for the YMCA, but I also work out here. Um, and so having, having those group classes, um, having you know, the support of my coworkers, we kind of, we work out together or my husband and I work out together. And so for me, that's has been really helpful in the past to have some sort of physical activity in whatever level of physical activity I can do. Um, and it has given me a sense of community as well um, because I've gotten to know people, you know, the same group classes, the same people come in. And so it gives you a sense of purpose. Like, oh, are you gonna be here Friday? Okay, cool, like I'll be here too. Um, and then for me, I love to color. So I get the coloring books and then I get like crayons or markers. I get all kinds of fancy stuff and I just take time to color. And that really frees up my mind to just be, you know, focused on one thing and not have to focus on my, my thoughts, those heavy thoughts that might consume you on a daily basis. Great. Ryan or Libby, how, how do you like to, to, pro, uh, to, to process or uh, what do you find helpful? Uh, I could definitely go next. I, 
um, for me, you know, just being kind to myself was very helpful for me because it really like allowed me to focus on myself without worrying about life stressors such as school and work. And also to concentrate on myself and accept my feelings as they are, as we are human beings. Um, I do enjoy um, healthy eating while avoiding like sugary products. So food allows me to re-energize myself. I also like to schedule my activities at least um, a day or one week in advance. Um, like going to the gym for a workout, like 60 minutes. Uh, what was not helpful for me was really like just wasting my time on people that did not really care about me, uh, especially when they, they did not have a disability or spine bifida. So as really, you know, like I mentioned before, it's really about finding what might be helpful and not helpful for you as you're going, our, as you're going through the grief process. Libby, what do you find helpful? So. I, like you, Carla, love to talk and love to process things while talking. So I think that is one reason why I like therapy so much is that I get to talk and express myself and explore my emotions in a safe, non-judgmental environment. So I process a lot through that way. I also love to just be with people. Um, I, there are times where I will pull inward and not want to be around anyone else, but that's mostly to let myself recharge, mm -hmm. um, my extroverted self. Um, but uh, a lot of the time I find helpful with grief was just talking about the good times mm -hmm. and talking about memories and sharing yes. them um, and remembering that just because the person <clears throat> isn't here doesn't mean that those memories and those um, good times don't exist anymore. They're there for you to hold on to. Um, and sometimes they're in pictures, sometimes they're in other mementos of the another individual's life. So it's important exactly. to remember that just having those things to hold on to is something that is really helpful. And what I've found helpful in ex my experience with grief. Um, Definitely. I and, and sharing, I think sharing stories and memories, especially of a person with mm -hmm. other, especially with others, uh, you're keeping the memory alive and uh, that can be a really powerful connecting experience uh, to just sit around and, and share stories and photos or make a scrapbook or do a ritual together that commemorates the person. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, so my advice uh, for living with grief is treat yourself as you would your best friend. I say that a lot for a lot of things. Accept and feel your feelings as they are. Take each day at a time or even each hour if the day feels too big. Take time for solitude, rest, and self-reflection. Make time to connect with supportive and caring people, including people that... Uh, you may not expect uh, or who wouldn't be at the absolute top of your list. Uh, sometimes even acquaintances, neighbors, or people you barely know uh, can be safe, reliable people to lean on. Uh, so don't count them out. Schedule a manageable handful of basic tasks and positive activities. That's what Clarissa flagged. And reflect on the people, things, and experiences you're thankful for. Uh, that touches on what Libby said. And I think we covered uh, other words of wisdom. Uh, so uh, these are just some uh, resources uh, that I found, and we will make these available to y'all. Uh, we have a mix of fiction, nonfiction, uh, different types of grief, including pet grief, uh, uh, the loss of a pet, uh, your own death, other people's death, uh, 
the interesting or difficult thing I found is that there's very uh, little on uh, that wasn't deeply ableist or for me uh, squicky about people uh, dealing with disability grief. Uh, it's uh, those stories, especially the fictional ones I find are often about able bodied people becoming injured, uh, losing the will to live uh, and uh, often suicide, which uh, I don't think we necessarily want. Uh, we're not in the mood for that. Uh, and we, I think, experience and perceive our disability very differently. Uh, so that's a genre that maybe needs some beefing up maybe by us that there's you can grieve a disability and find life after disability or during it or during right right mm -hmm. thank you i also wanted to share another uh thing another tool that i found helpful and i know it wasn't on the list that we had um i have an app that actually was um uh suggested by my therapist and it's called happy five and it's H-A-P-P-I-F-Y, and it was free to download, um, and, and it's free to use, um, and it just gives you like little tasks to answer during the day. Um, it deals, it talks about topics about anxiety and just different reflection uh, tasks, and it also does like meditation, um, so like a night meditation and that kind of thing, and they're all very manageable. I think the biggest lesson was like 10 minutes long um so it's very manageable five minutes um and it was just a tool that I found really interesting and I use it on a daily basis and I wanted to share it with you oh that's that's great happy fi happy fi so h-a-p-e-i-f-y and I have a I have an iPhone and so I was able to download it I don't know if it's on Android um but it was free to download and it was free to use so well, brilliant. So on that note, uh, are there other uh, books, movies, TV shows, music, uh, apps or resources that you recommend? So maybe pick one or two things that you recommend for processing grief. So oh, Colin. Oh, I do this again, Brian. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think so. It's not a they're not available everywhere, but I think what can also be helpful is finding a support group um, to yeah. help um, talk with others who have experienced similar things or similar losses. Um, I know that there are support groups for families out there who have experienced loss of a loved one um, and or the loss of a child or a loss of a grandparent, et cetera. I know that those support groups exist. Um, and I think those are a valuable resource because of the fact that they can often bring along um, camaraderie and <clears throat> peer support that is a type of support that a professional can't give mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or somebody who hasn't experienced a level of loss before. Um, and so I think those can be invaluable. That can be an invaluable resource. Yeah. I think the other thing that can be also helpful is um, really just your own thought processes and learning how to process your own feelings because we know that while books, movies, etc., videos can be realistic and helpful, sometimes they're the way grief, etc., is portrayed mm -hmm. may not be what exactly is like in reality. Yeah, right, right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, definitely. And I think uh, not all uh, portrayals are created equal or same. And also what is relevant or meaningful for you or that you resonate with yep. may not resonate with another person. So to each their own, and I think what matters is, does this help you to process and understand your own grief and do you relate to it? So Brian, uh, a resource you recommend for grief. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say that if you are um, a person of faith like me, for example, I'm a Christian, so it's it's really fundamental to my lifestyle and the way I live. Um, I'll definitely connect with with your with your pastor or with your church that you're affiliated with. It's it's definitely a great resource for you to to have if you are a person of faith. Um, also, just joining organizations like the Spine Biblical Association, we have so many amazing uh, people who are who are living with our condition like spine bifida um if you are extroverted for sure absolutely get, get connected uh to an organization that really um that that really is that really resonates with your with your condition like, like for example like spine bifida so yes absolutely get connected okay. with with uh with organizations like the sba and if you're a person of faith like me for sure absolutely uh speaking or connecting with the pastor or a priest out of church is definitely another good source uh, to go to. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, and I think that's uh, that can be a wonderful resource for folks who have a religion or spiritual practice or philosophy uh, that is important to them. Uh, and I think for me, uh, uh, I'm a sucker for uh, Pixar movies uh, in terms of, I think Pixar has been great at uh, depicting grief and loss, uh, and uh, they're consistently just banger tear jerkers. So I think if you need a good cry, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I always recommend Pixar. Uh, and speaking of, of uh, disability grief, uh, or processing movies, uh, I would say that the documentary Marwin Call is actually, uh, I think, a wonderful documentary that shows a person coming to terms with their injury or disability and finding a very creative way to process and come to terms with it. So uh, I, for disability grief processing, I recommend Marwin Call. And where, what is, where can we find that? Uh, Once Upon a Time, it was on Netflix. And uh, I always am a big fan of interlibrary loans. So hit up your local library for Marwin Call. And Disney Plus probably has Pixar movies. Oh, yeah, definitely does. So let's run through. Uh, uh, here's a... Uh, contact information for us at the Spina Bifida Association. Uh, looking through the Q&A, uh, someone pointed out, uh, don't try to gaslight us. I think in terms of how can people be supportive to someone in grief? So we're entitled to our feelings. Uh, people talk about uh, having lost other people with spina bifida. Uh, people talk about uh, feeling a shortened sense of uh, life expectancy. Uh, someone in the, in the Q&A mentioned having a medical procedure that impacts their reproductive capacity. So I think coming to terms with or grappling with, have we had children? Can we have children? And uh, how does that feel for us? And do we regret uh, having children, not having children, not being able to have children or losing that ability? Uh, well, and I also saw something in the Q&A that I felt like it was important to address along those lines, Carlin, mm -hmm. about the life expectancy and things. There are so many questions and so many answers and so many unanswered questions that I think that we as a population and the general population also grapples with that we may mm -hmm. never know the answers to. Right. And that's as much as we wish that there was an answer to everything, sometimes we just have to live with not knowing. And the ambiguity. And, uh, yeah. and sometimes, and the hardest thing is sometimes you kind of have to create your own closure. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think we want, uh, and this is true of a lot of things, if we want closure of, I want this person to apologize, uh, or I want this bad person to become a good person, or I want X to happen in the outside world, and then I will have closure. And mm -hmm. sometimes we don't get that. So mm -hmm. we have to uh, create our own closure and say, I am going to tell myself a story that allows me to make peace with this situation. Uh, because I can only control myself. I cannot control uh, other people or the universe necessarily. 
So here's an interesting question from someone. Uh, uh, lo lost uh, a parent. Uh, my mom was grieving the fact I need a wheelchair and snapped at me several times. I have one now, but how do you deal uh, with grieving parents who deny you things like a wheelchair. So I think the question is almost asking complex grief of what if you had a difficult or fraught relationship with somebody that you're grieving? Any thoughts on that? Can you elaborate? I'm not. In... Uh, I like, think so. Yeah. It just seems like a, a was grieving the fact that I need a wheelchair and snapped at me several times. I have one now, but how do you deal with grieving parents that deny you things like a wheelchair? So basically dealing with their expectations of what? I, th I think that's what the question is asking. Because that's hard too. Like I've had conversations with my mom, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I've had conversations with my mom about, you know, I think when you have a child, we, you have, I don't have children yet, but when you have a child, you know, you have this expectation that they're going to do all the things, right? Or we want them to do all the things. And that might not be the case for you, for us, um, or it may look different. And so having, I think giving our parent or guardian the space to grieve it, to grieve that expectation, um, and then sometimes, like you said, creating our own narrative and understanding that we may never get that closure or we may never get that that seal of approval or that seal of whatever we need it to be from parents or guardians or whoever, and just moving on with our lives. Like we are now adults, right? And so now we get to make our own story and we need to then now reach out to others and network and create our own family because we our family in a way, like Brian was saying earlier. I mean, anytime I encounter anyone with spina bifida, I feel this kinship that I'd never feel with blood relatives, you know? So um, I think understanding that is important too. Libby, or, or I think Brian had his hands up. Brian has oh. his hands up. So I'm not Brian. gonna interject and try to talk about over him. I know, <laughs> we'll be quiet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I feel like, this question really resonates with me a lot, you know, going back from a, you know, from a 12 year old kid, you know, inside of me, where I was trying to negotiate with my mom, you know, and like I mentioned earlier, my mom was already overly protective, right, and right, and reasonably and rightfully so, um, but I wanted to do things independently now so that I can definitely be more prepared once I enter the, the, um, the adulthood. So I think it's it's really important to have that proper healthy dialogue with your parents and really yep. making sure that your expectations are different from their expectations, like Clarissa mm -hmm. was saying. So it, it's really about creating that healthy dialogue, having that conversation with your parents, you know, set time for yourself to make that conversation happen. And hopefully that, that can definitely change, uh, I won't say hearts, but definitely change minds. You know, yes, you still have to support your parents, of course, absolutely but you able, you'll be able to have more freedom as you age along the way in living with spine bifida. And hopefully I can, you know, I address that question um, effectively and appropriately. Yeah. And other resources people have recommended, uh, someone said there's a book called Fuck Death that I read after my mom died. It has a list of taboo things to say. Uh, Elizabeth said, I found EMDR helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, Another person recommended living after a loved one has died and a book called Good Grief that has a workbook. Uh, the Fault in Our Stars is really great, says another attendee. And yes, another another attendee asks, uh, will these resources be on a document? Yes, they will, because I talk about their support group at church called Grief Share. Uh, uh, folks say, uh, Listen to Worth It by Colby Kelly. Uh, and uh, someone talked about uh, their parents refusing to make the bathroom accessible. Uh, I was able to find the strength to cut them off for their toxicity. But what can people do who can't cut off their family? Uh, and that may be also a kind of uh, grief plus other emotions uh, because our uh, our, our uh, relationships with our family members and caretakers can be very complex. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone in chat also mentioned that uh, 
when they've been grieving a friend with spina bifida, uh, people have asked, hey, do you think you're next? Which is a thing to say to someone with a disability, mm -hmm. for sure. And oh, here's a great question. Is there a grief support group for people who have spina bifida or anyone who has a disability that you know that I can attend online? I wonder if Juanita knows of any or do you guys know of any? Hi, I don't know if you can see me, but um, so there are some some uh, states, some areas do have support groups and <clears throat> we can add that to the resource list. Whatever I can find out, we'll add to the resource list. Um, the association is also working on putting together or reviving or restructuring a support group, not really a support group, but an opportunity to get together that we used to have called Join the Conversation, um, which was just an opportunity for adults to just to come together and just chat about about things. So we will definitely let you know as soon as something as we as as we know, we will let you know as soon as we know about um, support groups. And I'll add that to the list of resources that Carlin mentioned. Juanita, I really wanted to just interject something really quickly before we wrap up for the night. I think I saw in the Q&A, somebody asked the question, why so many of us individuals with spina bifida are passing away at an early age. And I think what's important to say is that we on this panel can't answer that question uh, because we're equally not Sure. And also for the fact that we are also not medical professionals or types of professionals that can answer that question. Mm -hmm. And there is research being done everywhere and lots of things going on to try to investigate that. But there are still very few answers. So don't be surprised when no one can answer that question because there's a lot of uncertainty and still a lot of education and research going on around that. Yep. And I I was going to say that it's due to pro likely a complex mix of factors of your mm -hmm. inherent disability status, any life accidents or, or health in incidents you may suffer, where you live, uh, diet, so uh, insurance, uh, access to health care, mm -hmm. uh, yep. all of these all things, things combine. But I also I think it's fair to say that even an able body has those factors, right? I Absolutely. mean, Absolutely. nobody can really determine, uh, you know, maybe a professional doctor can give you a guesstimate, you know, you're more likely to have cancer, you're more likely to have a heart attack, you're more, you know, those things can be a marker, but even able body, you don't, have a a clear idea of when that will happen so I mean I, I just I wanted to say that you know because it's not just a spina bifida issue it's just an overall we don't know yeah I, I think where I was more gearing towards that answer is the fact that a lot of people are curious and wonder why right. so many of us at 30 and 40 and 50 years old are mm -hmm passing away. And right. with the recent number of deaths that we've had in, within our community, just mm -hmm. in the last several months, that question has come up a lot. And I think the important thing is to remember that we can only predict things. We can't know for certain. Right. And that the information and um, research is still being done on those types of that topic specifically. So it's hard to know, um, but sometimes we have to be willing to sit with the unknown. Mm -hmm. That is true. Uh, and uh, so are there uh, final thoughts? I mean, th thank you all for coming. Uh, I think just, uh, my final thought is just uh, keep on trucking. Uh, 
change is the only constant uh, and enjoy what we have uh, and who we have uh, while we have it and, and uh, while it's here. Thank you, Brian. Carlin. Thank you, Libby. Oh, yeah. Brian, sorry. Just want to add a final comment before we leave. Uh, keep climbing mountains no matter what. Keep climbing mountains um, and really embrace the uncertainty. Uh, we are here to support you guys no matter what. Uh, we are a community and we're a family. Just yeah. want to add that. Final word of wisdom, Libby. I think just make sure that you are taking care of yourselves and uh, remember that it's okay to put yourself first sometimes. Absolutely, final word of wisdom, Clarissa. I think for me, uh, because we tend to, at least myself, I tend to self-isolate with my thoughts and my feelings, always be encouraged to reach out to us, to any of us um, and to whoever you can in terms of the spina bifida community. Um, understand that you're not alone with feelings and thoughts that you may have. Um, probably we're all feeling the same thing. Um, and so be aware of that and be very hyper aware of it because you're not alone and it's never alone. And, and even if it's just one person to hear you out, then that's okay. And that's great. Um, so always seek help, seek community and network and, you know, ask for those resources. They're there. So, you know, just don't be afraid to speak up for yourself and to self-advocate for yourself and for your own self-care. Beautiful. Thank you everyone. And, and thanks Juanita for uh, manning the, the helm from behind the scenes. And thank you all for your wonderful answers. And thanks to our attendees for their questions, comments, and resources. Uh, appreciate you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.